welcome to Rehoboth. And if you're online, welcome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, one of the responsibilities Joy has is to start the service on time. And I want y'all to notice she did not start the service on time, right? I mean, I'm not trying to throw her under the bus because the reality is I was supposed to be the one to start the service today. And Gary Wise is back there and wouldn't kept talking and wouldn't turn me loose. And so here we are. We all know, not just America, the world changed yesterday. We're going to lean into that a little bit later when we read scripture and pray. It is a very serious matter. It is something that, that the word speaks into, and we need to let the word speak into this. That being said, we have gathered here today to worship the sovereign God of all creation. Stand and worship him. Lord this morning with a prayer that just says, God, I need you. Would you sting with us this morning?
Amen, amen. Would you be seated? Good morning. Sorry for walking up a little late. If we haven't met yet, my name is Faith, and this is my husband, Dalen. And <laughs> if it's your first Sunday with us, welcome. We would love for you to stop by the welcome table, which is on your right over here after the service and let us get to know you a little bit. And if it's your first time online, welcome to you as well. You can drop a comment to let us know that you're watching and we would love to say hi to you. Hi, everyone. <laughs> uh, thanks, Faith. Thanks for being here. Um, so our Rehoboth students, boys, I'm talking to you. So listen up. So we have some great things planned. Uh, July 22nd through the 25th, uh, we have a global missions immersion uh, planned for our students, which will be going to the community of Clarkston and we will be taking on global missions in a local context. So uh, it's gonna be really exciting and we, we have great opportunities to serve uh, our community. And also we are going to Andretti, go-karting, and games, so Rodney, I see you over there. So <laughs> it's gonna be really fun. So you can register um, at rehoboth.org slash GMI. The cost is $25 for everything that we're doing. So if you ask me, that's a pretty good deal. Rehoboth.org slash GMI. Um, and also coming up is our 170th year anniversary of Rehoboth. Is that exciting or what? Yeah. So in, in 1854, wow, a small group of people met here uh, to form a church and 21 new members were baptized and a little mission church grew out of this place. Uh, so join us on Sunday, August 4th. Uh, to celebrate this, this wonderful thing that the Lord has carried through many generations and, and all these years um, at 10 a.m., August 4th at 10.30 a.m. We have a beautiful service planned um, and we will celebrate with lunch to follow. So come join us on August 4th and bring a friend. It will be quite a day to remember. And if you are interested in being baptized on that Sunday, August the 4th, during the 170th anniversary, you can email us at pastorsoffice at rehoboth.org, or you can call the church office. We would like to thank you for your faithful and generous giving, and remind you that you can give several ways, either by text or in person at the baskets in the back of the sanctuary, or you can give by mail or online at rehoboth.org slash give. Thank you all for being here this morning to worship with us. So if you all would stand and greet one another with a handshake, a high five, or a fist bump, just say hello.
Hey folks, if you would find your seat again. I love a church family that loves each other. One of many reasons joining us in person is truly a rich blessing is this alone, just being able to greet one another and encourage one another. Yesterday, the world saw the attempted assassination of former President Donald Trump. And the evil act took the life of one American and injured others. In God's providence, the former president tilted his head ever so slightly just before an attempted assassin's bullet ripped through his ear. The image of the former president with blood streaming down his face has already been seared into the memories, not only of America, but people around the world. Freedom was attacked yesterday. America's presidential election was attacked yesterday. Decency, as well as law and order, was attacked yesterday. Democrats, Republicans, Independents, and all other political parties were attacked yesterday. Christians are guided by the Bible and are not uninformed about these matters. This unspeakable evil arose out of the brokenness found in all of humanity and the deep, violent divides brewing throughout our country. It was the act of one individual who is drunk from the cup of venom spewed by presidential candidates and political parties, by political pundits, podcasters, and cultural influencers. It's been filled with venom by folks standing on sidewalks and sitting around kitchen tables. And yes, even some who call themselves pastors and ministers have injected their brand of poison into this cup. Satan who wars against a holy God and all that is good schemes to build a society that produces the evil we witnessed yesterday. He schemes to build a society that produces this kind of evil on our streets and in our homes. But God's not surprised. He's not fallen asleep, nor is he anxious about these events. We are witnessing the judgment of a holy God on a nation that has become prideful and rebellious and has turned away from this holy God and his ways. We are seeing God pull his good and sovereign hand back from restraining evil. We are witnessing God's judgment where he is allowing us, America, simply to be who we are and to experience the consequences of our own depravity. God is withdrawing his restraining grace as a means of discipline and judgment. Remember what God told Abimelech in Genesis chapter 20, verse 6? I, it was I who kept you from sinning against me. The problem in America today is not Democrats and Republicans or other political parties. The problem in America today is far deeper. The problem exposed by the attempted assassination yesterday is not simply a Democratic problem or a Republican problem or a problem of any political party. As Romans chapter 3 says, none is righteous, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside together. They have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asp is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery. 
and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Christians, a different platform shapes our thoughts, inspires our hopes and our dreams and guides our steps. We seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And with the help of the Holy Spirit, the Lord tells us not to be overcome by evil, but to overcome evil with good. Today, we pray for former President Trump and his family. We pray for the families of those who lost a loved one, and we pray for those who've been injured. We pray for America. Yet we need to remember that it is not Joe Biden or Donald Trump who are the heralds of good news. We are the heralds of good news. The only good news that can heal America. Jesus is our prophet, priest, and king. And Jesus saves all who repent and believe in him. For our scripture reading, we're reading through the book of 1 John. And God in his providence providentially led us to schedule 1 John chapter 2 verses 1 through 6 some time ago for today's scripture reading. He knew this was a passage we needed to hear, we needed to reflect upon, and we needed to drink in today. Hear God's word. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin, but if anyone does sin... We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation of our sins, and not only ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. And by this, we know that we have come to know him. If we keep his commandments, whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Let's pray. Father God in heaven, thank you for your word and for teaching us. Thank you for not abandoning us in this hour. Thank you, God that you have prepared us even for this moment. You have reminded us that we are children of the King and we are citizens of His kingdom. We are grateful for this country. We are grateful to have lived in this place. We know we have brothers and sisters in places that are far more oppressive and wicked. And yet, Lord, we are watching wickedness ooze out of every corner of our nation. We understand from your word that this is not simply happening solely because one actor or one individual or one group has desired to do so, but rather our adversary, your enemy, Satan, is fostering these things. Oh God, may we be heralds of the gospel. May we remember that we alone are ambassadors of peace. Father, may we be bold in this hour and not afraid. May we not walk away from our responsibility to be a witness of the King of kings and the Lord of lords that he may save. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. There's a song we've done here at Rehoboth, but not in quite a long time. And um, it just says a very simple chorus, your praise will ever be on my lips, will ever be on my lips. When times are good, we praise God. When times are bad, we praise God. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. And we say, blessed be the name of the Lord. Would you stand and sing this chorus with us? Like a ring of solid 
let go Like a vow that's been tested Like a covenant of old And your love is enduring Through the winter rain And beyond the horizon With mercy for today And faithful you chorus with me. Oh, come. 
Thank you so much. You may be seated. All right, prayer. All earthly things with earth will fade away. The prayer grasps eternity. But I'm convinced of this, God does not hear prayer. He hears desperate prayer. Prayer is not a position, whether you need. Prayer is not a position, it's a disposition. You get to the place where you'd rather sweat, you'd rather weep in his presence than laugh in anybody else's presence. You'd rather God whisper a speaking into your heart that breaks you. And somebody give you the prizes that all the world covets. Prayer is almost the greatest human privilege that we have. Well, good morning, church. It is good to see all of you this morning. I'm glad you're glad to see me, too. Um, if we have not met before, my name is JD, and I am thrilled to be up here with you this morning. Um, do any of you remember a time when you wanted something really, really badly? Amen. Amen. Somebody wants something right now. <laughs> Maybe lunch, right? Um, yeah, yeah, we all go through those times, and, and what can be challenging is when you want something deeply with earnest desire, but there's not anything you can do to actually make it happen. You know, many of you have probably had that instance where as a child, there was something that you really, really wanted as a gift, maybe for Christmas or your birthday, and you hoped for it, you prayed for it, you dropped some very not so subtle hints for a really long period of time to remind maybe your parents, maybe your grandparents that, hey, don't forget that that was the thing that I really wanted. And then you're opening the gift and you open that up and then boom, there it is. Or maybe there it isn't, <laughs> right? Sometimes things don't always work out the way that we want them to or the way that we thought that they would. So over Independence Day last week, uh, my family, we were out of town, uh, out of state actually, and we, I really wanted to do some fireworks and, and wanted to make this happen. So I'd seen one of those fireworks tents that just pops up out in the middle of a field somewhere. And so I went down there, nothing crazy. I just figured I'd get a few things. We'd have some pops. We said some flashes and maybe it would be fun for the kids, right? Oh, was I... Uh, optimistic. <laughs> uh, so nothing crazy that I'd, I'd gotten, just some, a few small things and a couple big things that I thought I might sprinkle in there, right? So we get out there on the 4th and I'm, I'm setting everything up and just as I've about got everything, I've got the lighter in hand, I'm all excited and there's a big crack of thunder and it starts to rain <laughs> And so we pack everything up, we go inside, and at that point it's, it's you know, almost kid bedtime, so pack it all up. We're like, well, we'll, we'll just do this tomorrow, right? We'll just do it on, on the 5th, right? So we get out there, it's the second try, I get the first thing out there, and it's, it's you know, we've, it's nothing crazy. I figured I'd kind of ease them into it. And uh, so I get one of those things, you know, they're, they're a little cone and they just spray little sparks, right, with little bits of pops. To a couple of my children, it might as well have been D-Day, because <laughs> uh, this thing starts going off, and one of the kids, she starts screaming and running down the street, and uh, before too long, half of my kids were already inside, and that was not really going the way that I thought, and then I found out that, you know, they do actually sell some really pitiful fireworks at some of those tents, right? And it's cheap, because it's cheap, <laughs> Right? And so uh, things just did not exactly go the way that I thought. But we did have a couple big ones that were fun for those of us who had the courage to stay outside. Um, but anyway, you know, there are things that are outside of our control that really do greatly impact your circumstances and how you handle your circumstances and, and the way that you think about what you're going through. So this week, you know, we're going to pick up and continue on in our series about some prayers out of the Old Testament. And, and we're going to look this week at a prayer given by a woman named Hannah. Her story is recorded for us at the beginning of the book of Samuel, 1 Samuel. And so if you would, go ahead and find your way there uh, so that you can follow along with me. It'll also be on the screens as well. So you see, Hannah, she was the wife of a man named Elkanah. I don't know many Elkanahs, but maybe you do, but I don't know any Elkanahs. But it would actually be better to say that she was a wife 
of a man named Elkanah. Because you see, he actually had two wives. And as is so often the case, when people choose to ignore or to thwart or to go against God's design for marriage in the family, which is one man, one woman, united together in covenant relationship before God for a lifetime, when we choose to do that, so often frustration and conflict and difficulty and moral challenges and failures, they they abound in our lives So Peninnah was one of his wives, and Hannah was the other. So the other wife with her husband, they had numerous children. However, what the scripture tells us is that Hannah did not conceive and had no children. In fact, what the scripture actually said was that the Lord had closed her womb Hannah wanted a son terribly, and and her husband, recognizing the, the anguish that she was in, he would show special care for her in the midst of that. But his other wife, she became a, a bit of a rival to Hannah, an antagonist to Hannah. Chapters 1 and 2 of of 1 Samuel tell this story. Each year, Elkanah would take his family up to Shiloh, and they would worship there, and they would offer sacrifices to the Lord, and they would feast, and they would do this annually. Their family, as as broken as it was, they do seem to have been devout in a day in which the end of the book of Judges will tell us just how broken people were, and, and, and that people were going their own way and doing their own thing. But this family did go to seek the Lord and to worship him. But Peninnah, the other wife, would continue to just needle at Hannah that she did not have any children. And this didn't just happen once or twice. What the scripture tells us is this actually happened year after year after year. The scriptures say this in in 1 Samuel chapter 1 verse 7. It gives us a picture of where Hannah is at at this point in her life. It says, therefore Hannah wept and she would not eat. One year after they had sat down to eat at this feast they would have, uh, Hannah has not eaten and she rises and goes to the temple Of the Lord. And this is what the scripture says in chapter 1, verses 10 and 11. It says, She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall touch his head. So the priest actually sees her there praying, and, and she's so distraught. She's weeping, and, and she's, she's praying to the Lord, and she's mouthing the words, but she's not making sound. You know, she's praying in her heart to the Lord, and he sees her carrying on like this, and he assumes that she must be drunk. And so he actually rebukes her and tells her to put away her drink and to move on, But she responds to him, and here's what she says, verse 15 and 16 of chapter 1. But Hannah answered, No, my Lord, I am a woman troubled in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for all along I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation. It breaks your heart to hear what she's going through here. The priest then responds to her, and he, he kind of says a blessing over her and says, well, may the Lord do as you have said. And so Hannah leaves, but something's a bit different with her now. What the scripture says is she's no longer sad in her face, and she goes and eats. She's refreshed and reinvigorated and encouraged by her time with the Lord. And then a wonderful thing happens. <laughs> For those of you who know the story, you know where this goes. She conceives. Her and her husband, they do have a son, and she names him Samuel, the one who the book is actually named after. It carries his name. She named him that, saying, I have asked for him from the Lord. She prayed, and he answered her prayer. The scripture then says that, you know, he's very young, and and she raises him until he is weaned. And then she ultimately takes him up to Shiloh, to the temple, and she comes to Eli and says this, 
Oh, my Lord, as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who was standing here in your presence praying to the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition that I made to him. Therefore, I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he is lent to the Lord. And she, he worshiped the Lord there. So she honors this vow that she made to God, that if he would give her a son, she would dedicate him to service in the temple. And she honored that vow. Hannah would visit her son regularly as he served in the house of the Lord. And, and, and the scriptures actually say she would bring him a new robe each year and just kind of <laughs> envision how this would have looked. Uh, Hannah would go on to have three sons and two daughters. And her son Samuel would go on to become a great man of God, a judge in Israel and a prophet of God. He would be the one who God would actually use to anoint the first two kings of Israel the second of which being David, who we know so well. But we're not talking about Samuel today, are we? Some of you can pretty easily put yourselves in Hannah's shoes, in her distress, and in the challenges that she was facing. You don't know why, but things, good things that you want so badly, they're just not happening. You've wanted them for so long, and yet they elude you. You know, it's very possible that some of you may even be able to relate to the very specific struggle that Hannah had. And and you and your spouse want to have a child desperately, but for some reason it just isn't happening. Many of you, and, and likely most of you, whether now or in the past, have experienced that deep sense of loss that can come when we are walking through deeply challenging circumstances. And this morning, what we want to do is to look here at Hannah's story and and see what we can learn from her here. So, like I said, we're looking at prayers this month that we find in the Old Testament, and we're going to talk about Hannah's prayer. But we're not actually going to talk about the one found in chapter 1, where she goes and asks the Lord to remember her and to give her this son. We're actually going to look at a prayer that's found in chapter 2 after Samuel has been born and after she has given him to the Lord at the temple here. And so let's start reading. We're going to start in chapter 2, and I'm going to read verses 1 through 10. Follow along with me. And Hannah prayed and said, My heart exalts in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. There is none holy like the Lord, for there is none besides you. There is no rock like our God. Talk no more so very proudly. Let not arrogance come from your mouth, for the Lord is a God of knowledge. And by him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty are broken, but the feeble bind on strength. Those who were full have hired themselves out for bread, but those who were hungry have ceased to hunger. The barren has borne seven, but she who has many children is forlorn. The Lord kills and brings to life. He brings down to Sheol and raises up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and he exalts. He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and on them he has set the world. He will guard the feet of his faithful ones, but the wicked shall be cut off in darkness, for not by might shall a man prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Against them he will thunder in heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. There's a lot here. (laughs) We could probably spend a few weeks looking at Hannah's prayer here, but I've got three things that I'm going to pull out of this and leave with you. And and you'll notice in much of how she prays, there's almost a two-sided nature. She'll say something as a bit of a warning and then give some sort of an encouragement. And and I'm going to do much of the same here with my three notes for you. The first thing, many are proud. 
humble yourself and rejoice in God instead. Many are proud. Humble yourself and rejoice in God instead. So Hannah starts her prayer out by praising the Lord, exalting the name of the Lord. She's rejoicing, right? I mean, she's prayed for this son. He has come. She's celebrating. But the context in which she's doing this is very, very important. Notice that the way that she is rejoicing is in the context of her relationship with the Lord. And there's a few things about God that she reminds us of and she holds front and center in the midst of her rejoicing. You can hear them. There is none holy like the Lord. There is none besides the Lord. There is no rock like our God. And as she worships, she then turns her focus to warn those who would be proud before God. And this is a thread we want to pull on this morning significantly. Chapter 2, verse 3, it said, Talk no more so very proudly. Let not arrogance come from your mouth. For the Lord is a God of knowledge. And by Him, actions are weighed. You see, what she's doing here is pointing out how we are all prone to think a lot of ourselves and to think very little of God. I mean, what does it mean to be proud? I mean, we, most of the time when, when you're probably using that, you might be talking about, oh, you know, I'm, I'm really proud of my, my kids or of this, that, or the other. And, you know, there is, there's an okay element to this of, you know, it's, it's not necessarily wrong to be pleased with the accomplishments of others, yourself, etc. But when we're talking about pride in this context, and pride is a danger, and even good pride can move into this category— What we're talking about right here is, you know, total satisfaction in who you are and what you have done. You know, thinking that you, your achievements, your life situation, your job, your business, the little world that you've built for yourself is thinking too highly of that and attributing too much of that to your own cleverness or intelligence or resources or whatever. Here in this text, this pride is also tied to arrogance, you know, where pride now becomes a vehicle to belittle those around you and elevate yourself further as you compare yourself to those around you. I mean, look at me and what I've done. I'm better than those people, right? You see, here's what Hannah knows, is that we're often not really what we think that we are, Hannah knew that the Lord was where she would find her salvation, that the Lord was where she would find hope. Hannah had her son. And remember the other wife who had been nagging her and needling her. It would have been so tempting to go to her and, ha, I told you, look what I've done, right? And to rub it in her face and tell her to shut her mouth once and for all, right? But she doesn't do that. What Hannah knew was that everything that she had came from the Lord, not from herself. Everything. Chapter 1, and this is challenging, chapter 1 actually says that it was the Lord who had caused her to be barren. Even her barrenness, her inability to have children came from the Lord. And her son Samuel likewise came from from the Lord. And so what does she do in the midst of that? She doesn't puff herself up. Instead, she praises the Lord. He's holy. There's none like him. He is my rock. I mean, why would God have withheld children from her to begin with? And I'm just going to tell you, I'm not going to try and answer that for you. That's not for us to answer. That's in the hands of the Lord. But what we can know for certain is that because of what happened here and what the Lord did through Hannah's life, we are given a powerful example of what total reliance on God looks like when you are in need and you are without. Pride is a danger. Pride says, I'm all that I need. Pride says that I can build for myself what I want for myself, right? I can do it on my own. I've deserved this. I've earned this. It's mine. And that's dangerous. Pride is a danger because pride is when we put ourselves in charge. 
Pride is where we elevate ourselves. Pride is where we bring ourselves to that very, very bad place of looking at others and being thankful that we're not like them. We're better than those people, right? No, that is pride. And here's what you need to realize. You did not have anything to do with the decision of which country you would be born in. You did not decide who your parents would be. You did not decide what your skin color would be. You did not decide to be born with, you know, natural athletic ability or to be born without it. You didn't decide to be born right-handed or left-handed. Did you know that? Yes, your decisions have consequences, and I'm not saying that they don't. Yes, with organization and diligence and a strong work ethic, you're going to go farther than if you are lazy, disorganized, and unmotivated. And I'm not saying otherwise, but my point is that every single one of us, when we assume a position of pride, we are making ourselves out to be little gods. We've tricked ourselves into thinking that we've got everything under control, right? We've got this. But what you need to be reminded is that every single one of us, we are one phone call, one phone call, maybe a text message away from everything about your circumstances changing for the better or for the worse. Every single one of us. The Old Testament tells us about a man named Job <clears throat> He was wealthy. He was prosperous. He, he, he had everything that you could think a person would possibly want, right? And, and, and one day, one terrible day, messenger after messenger after messenger comes to him and tells him that his entire financial empire is gone. And it ultimately culminates in a messenger coming and saying, hey, all of your kids were feasting together and they've just been slaughtered, every single one of them. He lost everything in one day. There was not even time to absorb the blow from the first before the second, and then the third came. And yet here's what Job said. He fell to the ground and he worshiped God saying, naked I came from my mother's womb and naked shall I return. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away Blessed be the name of the Lord. I mean, hear the same in Hannah's words. Whether facing plenty or, or hardship, our response, it really should be the same. To bless God, to thank Him and rejoice in His salvation, because everything that you have and everything that you don't have is from Him. Many are proud. Choose instead to do like Hannah and humble yourself before God and rejoice in Him instead. So let's look at a second thing here. Many will trust in themselves, cling to the Lord instead. Many will trust in themselves, cling to the Lord instead. And some of you may think this is a mistake. It sounds too similar to the first, but hear me, we need to keep pulling on that thread of pride because there's more here. We've already talked about how pride, it, it centers around this puffed up assessment of who we are and what our accomplishments are. But you see, when we live like that and we live a life of pride, thinking that we've got everything figured out we ultimately come to a place of trusting in ourselves, right? I mean, it may be that we're trusting in our athleticism. Maybe that we're trusting in our intelligence or our wealth or, or certain people that are in our lives because so-and-so is in my life. I mean, nothing bad could happen to me, right? Or maybe you've got that, you know, emergency fund built up. And you think that because you've got X number of months pay saved up that surely you can survive any, you know, financial disaster that might come your way, right? Some of you have experienced that that is not always the case. Sometimes it's trust in a particular person or in a political candidate or a party, but here's the problem. Whenever we're putting our trust into things, other people or ourselves, we're ultimately trusting in things that do not have ultimate control and they will and can at some point let you down. You cannot ward off every undesirable alternative that could come about in your life. Try as you might, you cannot. You cannot prevent all calamity in your life. 
And when we try to, what we are actually doing is fashioning little idols for ourselves, little pretend gods that we think have our back. And that idol may be a thing, a person, it can even be yourself. And here's the thing, and here's something that we've all got to be reminded of over and over and over again, and you can see it in what Hannah has for us here. God is totally able to crush any idol. I'm about to knock my water off. Let me start over. God is totally able to crush any idol that you have built for yourself and to wipe it from the face of the earth and to rip it out of your hands. And sometimes he does that as a mercy to you. But it is far easier and it is his desire that we would lay those things at his feet. As we move into the middle of Hannah's prayer, Hannah points to the futility of trusting in yourself and what you've built up for yourself. I mean, look at the statements that she makes here. The bows of the mighty are broken. The full are hungry. But notice the other group that she talks about in kind of the other side of her statements. The feeble, the weak, bind on what? Strength. The hungry are now filled. The barren, the one who was unable to have children, has now born seven. So where is this group she's talking about, the one that we really want to be a part of? Where are they finding their strength, their uplifting It's in the recognition that their help comes from the Lord, the one who makes poor and makes rich, the one who brings low and who exalts, the one who raises up and the one who made heaven and earth and stands as Lord forever over his creation. You see, what Hannah knew is that there are many things that we think we've got control over that we really don't, and you can't work your way out of them. And there is indeed troubles you walk through that you can't navigate your way out of it. You can't be clever enough to come up with a solution for it. And she knew that trusting in herself would ultimately yield to disappointment and further sorrow. I mean, remember where she was, distraught, filled with sorrow, torment, antagonized. And and, and notice where she went. She went to the Lord. And she said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant. She went to the Lord. And notice that she was uplifted afterwards, even before her son had been conceived. She was nourished. She was built up by spending that time with the Father You see, the Lord does not delight in being your backup plan. What the Lord delights in is when his children come running to him for everything, all the time, nothing out of bounds. Christian, this this applies to you in ways you might not realize. I mean, have you drawn a nice, tight little box in your life of what God's jurisdiction in your life is going to be? And does it stop maybe as you leave the doors here? I mean, and hear me on this. Shame on you if that's you. And that might sound harsh, but, but the reality of it is, is that this is, this is a perilous situation. You are neglecting the one who governs your out there, whether you realize it or not. You might think that you've got it all under control, but the truth is you're actually sitting in a little dinghy boat with holes in it at high sea. You are in peril. Instead, do like Hannah and humble yourself before the one who makes poor and who makes rich, the one who brings low and who exalts. And as the book of Jonah tells us, the one who owns salvation. Trust the one who actually has control rather than the one who thinks he has control. The honest truth of it is, is that by buying a nice little tight box to put God in in your life so that he doesn't mess up the other things you've got going on, the the sad reality is you are likely drawing a box around the people of God and setting yourself on the outside of it. And you are judging yourself unworthy of eternal life. And this, this segues into the last point that I want to make 
that we see here in Hannah's prayer. Many will be cut off in darkness in their wickedness. Trust God to guard you instead. Hannah concludes her prayer by bringing us to this timeless truth that's championed from the beginning to end of Scripture, that God saves His people. But there's another reality that is sad, heartbreaking, and should, should move us deeply, and it's that there are many who see that and choose instead to remain in darkness in their wickedness. I mean, let's look at this again here. Hannah gives us a warning. The wicked will be cut off in darkness, and not by might shall man prevail. Essentially, if you stay out there on your own, you will be cut off, and you can't muscle your way through this. We're talking about something beyond just the day-to-day struggles we might be dealing with. We're now starting to talk about our justification before God. What can we do to make ourselves right with God? You can't beat him. You can't. Hannah, she invokes this idea of darkness here, and it immediately took my mind to the Gospel of John, where John so often deals with with these motifs of darkness and light. In John chapter 3, verse 19, starting, it said, and this is the judgment. He's talking about Jesus. The light has come into the world, and the people loved the darkness rather than the light. Why would they do that? Because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out by God. One of the sad realities of a broken and, and, and sinful humanity is that we often don't realize just how bad things actually are. And, and I'm not talking about woe is us, darkest moment in all of human history. No, 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 that's, that's, I'm not there. Pick up a history book and what you're going to find is that people are just as broken as they have always been. And we need a Savior the same. 1 John 5 tells us that God is light. And in him, there is no darkness at all, none. As a result, when we come to him, we're exposed. Our brokenness and our sin is made apparent. I don't have it all together. I can't make it on my own. Worse, I've sinned against God and and, and I'm actually an enemy of God. I'm corrupted to my very core And all of these things are true of each of us before Christ comes into our lives. I mean, have you ever picked up something off the ground? I had a bag of potting soil that had been sitting on the ground outside for a few weeks, actually. I'd bought some extra and didn't need this bag yet, and I was saving it. I don't know for what, but it's still there. And I picked it up yesterday as I'm I'm cutting the grass and things. And underneath, you can imagine when I picked it up, what I saw underneath. Bugs and things all over the place. Like they scurry. He's like, oh, I've been exposed. And they run and flee everywhere, right? You've probably seen this too. But we do the same thing when we're exposed to God. Everyone who does wicked things hates the light. And all of us are born in wickedness. Jesus came as light. And how did that go? We killed him. We killed him. Why? Because we hate the light. But here's, here's the problem for us is that our life is waiting for us in the light. I mean, sometimes pride can take another form than even what we've talked about here. Pride may be where we know, we know how messed up we are. But we're too proud to that, admit that to anybody and to humble ourselves before God. So we put on a nice face We go and do the things we think we're supposed to, may come to church every week, check in all the boxes, but every single time this person knows and feels it in the deepness of their being, I'm a fraud. I don't belong here. Something's not right. This person just doesn't turn loose, just holds on 
to that idol of self. I mean, here's the danger, though. If you linger in that darkness, in those shadows, eventually that door does close to you. And any of you maybe, or those in your lives who you've turned to go your own way, you may, you know, believe in God, believe in Jesus, and say these things. The reality of it is, is that believing in Jesus is not the same thing as trusting him for your salvation before God. Scripture tells us that, that even the demons believe that there's a God, right? There's a big difference, though, between him being your Lord. Again, what Hannah is pointing us to is this invitation that we've got to come to the light, to join the ranks of his faithful ones. She's pointing us to acknowledge that we are not actually the center of the universe, and I'm not just talking about where the earth is located in the cosmos. I'm talking about in the, the purposes of creation. We are not at the center of that story. God is. And she's concluding, too, by reminding us why that's actually a good thing. And let's look at that. You can't do it, but God can do it. And Hannah reminds us in her prayer that God will guard the feet of his faithful ones and that God is going to judge the earth and all that's in it. And let's just call it what it is. That is a terror to those who are still walking in darkness. That is not good news if you are walking apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. But it is very good news if you are. It means that God is going to do what he said. He's going to write everything. And Hannah's reminding us of this. I, I want to close by kind of revisiting these three points again. Many are proud. Humble yourself and rejoice in God instead. Many will trust in themselves. Cling to the Lord instead. Many will be cut off in darkness in their wickedness, trust him to guard you instead. Church, Hannah knew that her only hope was going to come from God himself. It wasn't going to come from anything that she would find in and of herself, and she's drawing us to do the same. Don't try to navigate through life on your own. You were never meant to do that. God has given you his word and his church to guide you and direct you in how you are to live and to show you your need for him and your need for the gospel and what he has done to make it so that you can be reconciled and saved, rescued out of the darkness. And that is a message for each and every one of us, but it is also for those in our lives that do not yet follow Christ. But think about your life and the, the things that you walk through and struggle with and the challenges you're facing. I mean, it could be that you're pressed in your finances or you're dealing with strife at home with your spouse and your kids. I mean, it could be that you can't get your boss off your back at work or maybe that try as you might, you and your spouse cannot conceive. The reminder from scripture here is to not trust in your own strength to navigate these challenges. Pour out your heart to God, but then to trust Him to carry you through whatever it is that you're going through, whether He delivers you from it or not in this life. We can trust that He will go with us. The challenges that we face are real, but in Hannah, we see a model of, of, of trusting the Lord throughout. But I want to close again by, by pulling on the other thread that we've talked about. That I know that for some of you, the problem may not be that you're struggling to trust the Lord with you know, this particular situation or that particular situation. The problem may actually be that you're just walking in darkness, that you are not walking with the Lord at all. You have not received what he has done for you in the cross. And you're still trying to do that on your own and in your own might. We talked about this in Bible Fellowship this morning. There is nothing you can do to earn the favor of God. But the good news is that facing those impossible odds, the only being in existence who was able 
to do that, to earn that favor for you, has done it. And his name is Jesus. Jesus died to pay the debt that you owed so that you might be saved from the wrath of God and adopted into his family forever. And the question, if that's you, or for, for those of you who have received that grace and your heart is worshiping at the sound of the gospel every time that you hear it, that is the same message of salvation for the people in your lives who are not walking in the light, who are trapped in darkness and they may not even know it. But if that's you, and you want to receive that and start that journey, give your life to Christ, receive what he has done for you, come talk to us this morning. Come talk to us after the service this morning so that we can talk with you and walk with you together as you seek to follow the Lord, as you seek to give your life to him and trust him today. Church, prayer is a powerful thing. We, I mean, this is... We need to stop and think about this from time to time. Prayer is our ability to talk to the creator of the universe. I mean, does that give you goosebumps once in a while? That that's even an option for you? And yet we so often neglect prayer. We so often, you know, we pray over meals. You may pray with the kids at bedtime. You may have the, you know, the set moments that you pray, the same prayers that you've parroted for hundreds and hundreds of time. But that's not all that prayer is. Prayer is our access to God given to us by our Lord. And He desires to hear from us. Our prayers are like incense before Him. And when we neglect to pray, whether we realize it or not, the truth of it is, is that we are trusting that we can figure our way out through whatever it is that we're walking through. God knows what we're going through. God knows what's on your heart. Go to the one who has authority over everything that you're walking through today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the gift of prayer, God. And even now I acknowledge before you and we as a church acknowledge that Lord, you are holy, that there is none like you and that you God are our rock. Without you, we are, we are a boat drifting at sea. We've got no anchor in our lives, God, but you have given us an anchor and it is in our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for what you have done for us through the gospel, Lord. Would you forgive us from the times that we trick ourselves into thinking that we can make it through whatever we're walking through on our own, God? Would you draw us into fresh and renewed and invigorated dependence to you, Lord, trusting in you for every situation that we walk through, God? God, I know as we've talked about prayer and praying over the difficult things in our lives, that there are likely people even in this room that are deeply anxious and crushed with grief and sorrow over a situation that they're walking through, Lord. God, would you provide relief? Would you provide peace and salvation from whatever these situations might be, God? Help us as a church to walk with those who are hurting and broken and in need, Lord. We thank you for what you have done for us, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. What a timely and powerful message. Thank you, Pastor J.D., I'm going to call an audible, Pastor Troy. I don't do this often. But I feel like in light of that powerful, powerful message that we need to open up this altar. And today of all days, with what Pastor Troy shared, the needs that are in this congregation, I just want to open up this as an altar. And I want to invite you to come and stand or kneel and we're just going to go and sing that one chorus of, Lord, I need you. And if God is calling and moving on your heart to come and reach out to him, he's waiting on you. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. And
Remember the one who's the author of life, the one who is in control of whatever it is that you're walking through, and trust him in everything and go to him in prayer. You are dismissed and have a blessed week.